We recently received some photos from a past student and they were curious about what it was they were seeing. The photo was taken on a frosty morning and it was of the roof of a building. And you could see approximately every two feet on an otherwise frosty roof, these dark lines that ran from the ridge down to the eave. What the student was looking at is known as thermal bridging. And it turns out that the most typical way that we build homes today results in some amount of thermal bridging, which is a thermal short circuit between the inside and the outside. And it is most serious in a heating climate. So say climate zones four and above, so climate zones four through eight. What's happening when you're talking about thermal bridging is that the structural framing lumber is acting again as a thermal short circuit because it turns out that wood relative to most of the insulations that we use is a pretty good conductor. So it is effective at conducting heat into or out of the house. And in the case of the picture that the student sent in, what was actually happening is that the rafters were allowing heat from inside the building to travel out directly through the rafter, heating the roofing material and melting the frost. So that is uh, thermal bridging in a nutshell. The problem with thermal bridging is that there is a lot of framing lumber in the typical stick-built house. So each one of those framing members is effectively conducting heat out through the building envelope, essentially cooling the inside space. It turns out that a large percentage of the energy associated with a building after it's built is operational energy. And so thermal bridging is something that's happening 24 hours a day during the heating season. So those framing elements are actively conducting heat out of the building. You might wonder how serious the problem actually is because typical stick-built house has studs every 16 inches or two feet on center. But the reality is that as much as 25% of a wall could actually be solid framing lumber when you factor in doubled up studs at the corner and jack studs and king studs and so on around every window and door opening and headers and things like that. So particularly in a house that was not uh, value engineered to minimize the amount of structural framing, the problem of thermal bridging can be very significant. So this wall is fairly typical of a stick-built building. And you'll notice that obviously we have framing elements approximately every 16 inches on center, which are required by code and required for sheathing. But then we have all sorts of extra framing lumber inserted to create rough openings. And we've got what could be a solid pack out of wood above this window serving as a header to carry the roof loads. So you end up with much more framing lumber than you might anticipate in a typical wall that is supposed to just have framing lumber every 16 inches on center because of what we do with homes. We install windows and doors and other types of openings that need to be framed with wood. Every single one of these pieces of framing lumber is a thermal short circuit. Thermal bridging is occurring at every place that you have solid wood that runs from the inside of the building to the outside of the building. One alternative to a solid piece of framing lumber that stretches from the inside condition space to the outside is to take two smaller pieces of framing lumber and disconnect them, basically breaking that thermal short circuit. And that is something that is done. Uh, it's called offset studs. So you have one stud that touches the inside sheathing, and then a separate stud that is offset from that, either with a space in between them or where they're actually offset in plan view. And that, again, breaks the thermal bridge and dramatically cuts down on heat loss or gain through the solid framing lumber that you see in this model. Starting in 2006, the International Energy Conservation Code started talking about this idea of continuous insulation, which is a way to stop that thermal short circuit. Continuous insulation is basically a continuous layer of some R value, either on the outside of the wall or the inside of the wall that isolates the framing lumber from the conditioned space. So if you wanna think about thermal bridging just on a very personal level, it's costing you money. If you're building in climate zones four through eight, you're spending quite a bit of money to heat your house and the framing lumber, if it's not isolated from the outside air, is actively conducting heat into or out of the building envelope 24 hours a day. In addition, if you are building in a very hot climate, you're presumably air conditioning your space. And again, your framing lumber is conducting heat from outside the building envelope into the space and you're spending your hard earned dollars to cool that heat. 24 hours a day. 
If your goal is to build a super insulated house that operates very efficiently, perhaps you're shooting for a passive house or a net zero building, you want to stop that thermal short circuit. And the way to do it is to install continuous insulation either on the inside or the outside of the insulation envelope. There are a couple things you wanna keep in mind. So if you're building a stick built house, Typically, the insulation goes into the cavity, and that is the space between the studs. And that insulation is called cavity insulation. You would want to put insulation continuously on the outside of your framing or continuously on the inside of your framing. Again, just to isolate that poor insulator, your framing lumber, from the inside or outside air. The most typical solution to stop thermal bridging is to add rigid insulation, again, either on the inside or the outside of the wall. In a heat controlled climate like we have here in Maine, we're in the Department of Energy's climate zone six. We would typically put the insulation on the outside of the wall. That keeps our studs and sheathing well above the dew point so we don't have to worry about condensation forming inside the wall during the heating season. And the most typical way to do that is with typically a minimum R10 rigid foam on the outside of the sheathing and the outside of the framing. If you're opposed to using foam in your build, there are many other types of rigid insulation such as Rockwool. Roxel is one brand. They make a great product that is rigid, sold in four foot by eight foot sheets, and that can get nailed to the outside of your sheathing or the outside of your framing. Adding that continuous insulation to the exterior of the wall creates its own set of problems, not the least of which is how to attach your siding to the outside of rigid foam or rock wool insulation. The most typical way to deal with that is to install your insulation and then install strapping on the outside of that. So depending on what style of siding you're adding, your strapping would either go on horizontally for vertically oriented siding or vertically for horizontally oriented siding. So that's a relatively easy fix. It certainly is one more step, but it also creates another problem, which is that the thickness of your wall is just increasing and increasing. So if you are starting with a two by six stud, for instance, you have five and a half inches of cavity insulation between your studs. The International Energy Conservation Code guidance has you putting approximately an R 10 on the outside of that in climate zone six. And again, these numbers are approximate. You really wanna look at your own design carefully to make that decision. But an R10 is uh, two inches of extruded polystyrene foam, for instance. And so now the wall is five and a half inches plus two inches plus your interior finish, whether it's gypsum or boards and your exterior sheathing and siding. So the wall starts to get very thick. The other issue is that your windows also are getting pushed out further and further by the continuous insulation and the strapping. And this can create its own thermal bridging weakness. The most typical way to fur out your window is to basically install wood as a picture frame around the window rough opening and then install the window onto that picture frame. But now you've introduced another thermal bridging weakness on the sides and top and bottom of the window or door opening. As a result of that problem, there are now several solutions. The one that I'm most familiar with is made by Thermal Buck. And it is basically a rigid piece of foam cut into an L shape. And so rather than installing solid framing lumber around the window or door opening, you would install this product Thermal Buck, which is an insulated padding material that allows you to push your window out so that it's even with the exterior sheathing and the siding doesn't overlap the window, but rather dies into the side of the window. It's a nice solution. It's a good way to get around that problem. So this is a plan view of a typical stick built wall where we have our framing elements at 16 inches on center or two feet on center, depending on the size of the framing member. And you'll notice that we have cavity insulation and that gets installed in between the studs. And then I've also drawn in continuous insulation. Uh, this would be the outside of the building. This is the inside of the building. So in this case, we're installing the continuous insulation on the outside of the wall. And I've also installed it outboard of the exterior sheathing. Now, this exterior sheathing is a structural requirement. It's what gives the building its rigidity when the wind blows, for instance. What happens with cavity insulation only is that heat travels out through all of these studs. Heat travels from where there is some to where there is less, and it always takes the path of least 
resistance. So in Maine, for instance, in February, it might be zero degrees outside and 66 degrees or 68 degrees inside the building. So there's more heat here. That heat warms up these studs and travels out eventually. The stud is the short circuit in this case. It is the better conductor transmits heat much more effectively than the cavity insulation in between. If we introduce continuous insulation on the outside of the building, we now basically insulate this good conductor from the very cold temperature outside and the warmer temperature inside, effectively slowing or stopping the transfer of heat out through the wall cavity. Now, this is a nice illustration of why it's important to balance the R value of the cavity insulation and the R value of the continuous insulation on the outside of the building. As you travel out through this wall from a temperature standpoint, the temperature is dropping, right? If this is an effective insulation in between the studs, it's keeping the heat in the building. This sheathing on the outside without the continuous insulation is in contact with the cold outside air. So the sheathing gets cold. And as this R value increases, the temperature difference between this sheathing and this warm inside air increases. What eventually happens is that that exterior sheathing is cold enough so that it is below the dew point and condensation can form on the backside of that sheathing. Obviously, we don't want that. We don't want the walls to be wet. So that could be a risky wall scenario. If we introduce uh, continuous insulation on the outside of the sheathing, that helps trap heat inside the wall cavity, even if this is a high R value insulation. What we're trying to do with that continuous insulation is keep this sheathing above the dew point. So keep it warm during even the coldest times of the heating season. That's why the relationship between these two different R values is so important. Obviously, we want continuous insulation and we want good cavity insulation, but the amount that we put out here is tied to the amount that we put in here. So as the cavity insulation R value increases, so should the continuous insulation R value. I mentioned earlier that you can get help from the International Energy Conservation Code in terms of deciding what that is. There are a bunch of different ways you can do it. There's a formula that would help you calculate it based on what your inside design temperature and relative humidity are. Because the dew point temperature that we're concerned about is very closely tied to relative humidity of the air. Once you know those things, you can calculate what this should be based on what this is. You can also pick out of a prescriptive uh, table what this should be based on what this is. Remember that the goal in all of this is twofold. What is specifically called out by the International Energy Conservation Code is that we need to isolate the framing lumber, which is a good thermal conductor, from the outside cold air in a heating climate or the outside hot air in a cooling climate. And we do that by putting continuous insulation across the framing lumber, either on the outside of the building or the inside of the building. That's goal number one. That's the explicit goal of continuous insulation is to stop thermal bridging. But if you're building in a heating climate, say zone four or above, so zone four, five, six, seven, or eight, there is this other thing that's happening inside the wall. And that is that this sheathing can potentially get cold enough that it is below the dew point. And if you have warm, moist air inside the building that is able to escape into this wall cavity, say around an electrical outlet or some other type of penetration in the wall, when that warm, moist air is cooled by hitting the backside of this cold sheathing, it sheds its moisture in the form of condensation. So the moisture goes from a vapor phase to a liquid phase on the backside of the sheathing. Obviously, that's not good. We don't want water inside the wall cavity. The way we prevent that from happening is to keep this sheathing warm. So that is a very important goal number two with continuous insulation. We want to keep all of these surfaces out here on the outside of the wall above the dew point. Then we don't have moisture forming inside the wall cavity. The way to do that is to provide adequate continuous insulation or adequate R value in the continuous insulation on the outside of the building envelope in climate zones four and above. So this is the way we typically build timber frames. We have the timber that is completely 
uh, exposed on the inside of the building and continuous insulation on the outside. And we're able to do that using SIPs, structural insulated panels. Inherent to that system is continuous insulation that's on the outside of the framing lumber. So when we build a timber frame with SIPs, we generally don't worry about thermal bridging. In this class, we're going to teach you about timber framing, engineer the beam, cut the joinery, and finally how to raise the building. We received a huge response from people who signed up and they're cutting their frames right now. And we would like you to become a can-do person, knowing that there is nothing you can't do in the area of building a timber frame. So as you might imagine, much of this is relatively easy to manage when you're talking about new construction. But if you're talking about a deep energy retrofit and you want to try to eliminate thermal bridging, it can get much more complicated because your windows and doors and siding are already installed. So there are a couple of different approaches. One is that you might try to do this energy retrofit from inside particularly if your siding and windows are in good shape and you'd like to keep them. It might be simpler and less expensive to pull off your interior finishes and add continuous insulation there. Much less waterproof type work to do around windows and doors and things like that. Alternatively, if you're planning on peeling off the siding because you might like to replace windows and doors, there are a number of options such as the zip system sheathing R, and that is basically the zip system which is an osb product available in four foot by eight foot sheets that has a rigid foam laminated to what would be the inside face so the, the nice thing about the zip system is that your water resistant barrier is already installed on the sheathing and there uh, the zip system our product also has insulation on the other side of the OSB. So as you're installing your sheathing that will serve as the nail base for your siding, you're also installing the continuous rigid foam on the exterior of your studs. That product is available for both wall and roof sheathing. Another situation that we have not discussed is continuous insulation uh, with the timber frame. The way that we build timber frames by first standing up the timber frame and then wrapping it with structural insulated panels provides continuous insulation on the outside. So we don't have that thermal bridge really existing anywhere other than the single piece of framing lumber that exists around every window and door opening in the SIP system. So we've already largely eliminated thermal bridging just due to the fact that we're installing SIPs. If you're building more traditionally with no timber frame and just SIP as your structural and enclosure system, then again, you're already largely eliminating the thermal bridging problem. So part of my answer to the original question about what's going on here was that clearly that was an example of thermal bridging where the heat traveling out through the rafters of the house was significant enough to melt the frost on the roof on the outside of the building. The obvious answer to fix the problem is to add insulation, either on the inside or the outside of the framing. The concept of thermal bridging is relatively simple. We have this element inside the wall that is a better conductor than the insulation that exists on either side of it. So heat will always take the path of least resistance and travel out through that good conductor rather than traveling out through the insulation. So there is a relatively easy fix. We just need to insulate that poor conductor. But in reality, accomplishing that can be complicated and there are many different factors to consider. I recommend starting with looking at the International Energy Conservation Code in your zone so you have an understanding of what the code requires. That would be a good step one. You also want to look carefully at your budget and how the choices that you make will affect all of the other things that need to happen when you're building. I touched on a few of them today, just this idea of the wall getting thicker and thicker as you add continuous insulation and how sometimes adding continuous insulation on the outside of the wall makes it difficult to install siding. So you then need to add strapping and how the strapping also complicates uh, the building assembly. It is really best to sit down and think about all of these different possible problems and some solutions that are available to you and also incorporate what the building code is asking you to do and come up with a solution that works for you, for your budget, for your climate, and for your architectural style.